There are now six confirmed cases of COVID-19 at Bay State, according to Dr. Mark Kerouac, the president and CEO of Bay State Health. He said they're working on increasing testing capacity, as that's been a challenge for hospitals across the state and country. Carolee McGrath sat down with Dr. Kerouac to find out more about the situation and how Bay State is and has been responding. Well, as of today, uh, we have six confirmed positives. Uh, we've tested 234 people uh, and know that 104 of them came back negative, six positive, and so we're still waiting on 124. Most of those are folks that are at home recovering, uh, but we have several dozen people who are in isolation right now waiting for those tests to come back. Tell me a little bit about the um, how many beds you have available and how you've prepared. Yes, well, before this even started, we had 80 beds uh, that were so-called negative pressure, which means they suck in oxygen from the hallway and then out uh, through a filter. Uh, so they were suitable for the care of patients with COVID-19. Uh, we took out of mothballs uh, a 12-bed unit and uh, converted it to a complete isolation unit where we plan to put our confirmed cases. And back, from back 2014, we had a, a two-bed ICU that was open for possible Ebola patients, which fortunately never came, but that unit was reactivated as well. Okay. Tell me the situation with your employees and the precautions that are being taken. Well, all of our employees who are caring for these patients have been trained on how to take on, uh, put on and take off protective equipment. We've uh, done training and videos, and we have observers watching them do it to make sure they do it correctly. Um, we had sent out a, an alert to all our employees to not come to work if they had colds or the flu or whatever. Um, and we had a, a sudden rush of people uh, descending our, on our employee health services, which, which did cause a bit of a backup. There are uh, a couple of hundred people, 200 people now, who are at home, uh, most of them have a simple cold uh, and they're waiting for a test result to come back. Okay. Tell me a little bit about the testing because I know that obviously the, the numbers are expected to surge, but the testing right now is difficult and that's something that, yeah. that you want to address. Yeah, testing really has been a major problem for us. It means we're kind of flying blind for many of these milder cases and it's, you know, 80% of the people who get this infection will have only a mild illness. Um, but uh, early on, uh, the, there was very few test kits available, so they had to really prioritize people who were seriously ill or uh, healthcare workers. And now there are a number of commercial labs that are coming on, so we expect that to ramp up quickly. Uh, but it hasn't happened yet. Right now, uh, we have the availability to test uh, dozens of people every day, but we're prioritizing people who are in the fight, the healthcare workers, people who are in the hospital and who we would like to get off of isolation if we could, uh, direct contacts of known cases. And so folks who have just a mild cold or a mild flu who come for evaluation will often just be sent home and told to self-quarantine, and we just don't have enough test kits to test them now. But those tests are then sent out, correct? That those they're not tests done are sent out to a commercial lab. We ha we're using one in New Jersey and one in Marlboro, um, and the turnaround has been three or four days up until recently. We're hoping that that's going to come down in the next couple of days to a 24-hour turnaround. Is it possible that you'll be doing all the testing in-house? That's our ultimate goal, and uh, we have to jump through a hoop, few hoops and get certain materials to make that happen, but we already test for 20 different viruses with a turnaround time of about four hours, and that would be ideal, just to send it to our big lab up in Holyoke and allow them to sort of quickly turn it around the way they do all the other viruses. Uh, there are shortages as a result of the demand in testing for simple swabs as well. Uh, so there's, you know, we're scrambling to make sure we have enough swabs to do the testing in addition to the equipment up in the labs. So getting back to the employees who are staying home out of, um, you know, just being precautious, how are you replacing those employees uh, to come in and care for the other patients that you have? Well, we've canceled all elective surgery, and so there are a number of employees who are not doing their usual job, who have volunteered or been, uh, you know, reassigned to doing other jobs, and we have basically been scrambling our workforce to, you know, plug very, very basic holes, and people have been terrific in terms terms of willingness to step up and do something new uh, or something different. Um, and people are in some kind of unusual roles, uh, but it's really an all hands on deck kind of situation. Do you foresee the sort of the drive through testing that we have seen in other states coming this way? 
I'd like to be able to do that. I think that uh, we would first need to have plentiful test kits available. Right now, uh, if we're short on swabs, you want to prioritize the people who, you know, for whom it's most important and not the people who you expect are going to recover on their own. Um, but I think ultimately the way that other countries have gotten their arms around this epidemic is to really test a whole bunch of people. In South Korea, they're testing 10, 15,000 a day, uh, and that's the way they finally, you know, got their arms around it. Is a hold up on the federal level? Is that where you're running into difficulty? Well, it's kind of a long story, but there, uh, the, the federal government insisted on developing their own test. Uh, when they sent it out, uh, it had some bugs in it and really couldn't be used and had to be, you know, done again. Nobody at the federal level expected it to be as vast and as broad as it is right now. Um, and so they've been constantly p uh, playing catch up uh, on this, uh, which is too bad because there is an international test available uh, that other countries are using and are able to test you know, far more folks than we are. So when you talk about prioritizing testing, uh, those, you know, with severe symptoms, I think there's a lot of confusion out there because obviously it's still flu season. People are still getting sick. And I'm talking especially for children, you know, you know, yeah. they might have strep throat or an ear infection. What's the first step that you take if you have a child at home or maybe it's you yourself who is not feeling well? Well, the first thing you do would be to call your uh, provider to call your physician uh, or to call an urgent care center. We don't want people just showing up and sitting around in the waiting room possibly infecting other people. Uh, we have, an, in terms of the folks answering our phones, they would take you through a series of questions that would determine if indeed you were well enough just to stay home and monitor your temperature day by day and check in from time to time, or if you sounded like you were sick enough that you really ought to come in and get checked out. If indeed you do that, we have a special area in our emergency room which kind of bypasses the usual emergency room. So again, we're not infecting other people. So they would send you to the emergency room. So if you were on that on the phone, yes. perhaps with your pediatrician's office, they'd go through those requirements. How high is the fever? How long has it lasted? Right. And, you know, let's say you had a fever with shortness of breath. Well, that would you know then get you right into the emergency room. And to be evaluated, you need to meet a physician or a nurse who's already in full protective gear too, because we don't want to expose them either. Uh, which is why we use a special kind of bypass, if you will, uh, where you walk in the front door. If you've got respiratory symptoms, you take a left turn and you go to one of a number of stations where you'd be evaluated, uh, possibly for COVID. Some of those people do get swabbed. Um, some of them get admitted and put on isolation, waiting for the swab to come back. Uh, but we really try to prioritize the sickest individuals, as well as those who will be critical for us to respond to what we think is going to be a surge. I know that Senator Warren is um, uh concerned about making sure that hospitals, especially in Massachusetts, have the necessary equipment and protective gear. Um, how do you feel in, in the current situation? Well, I think across the nation, there isn't a hospital that isn't worried about this. You know, you have the, the usual rate of usage and, you know, several days of supply, but everyone's expecting the usage is going to go up. Uh, and so people are working, you know, at the state level and at the national level. Uh, we've actually had a number of manufacturing companies raise their hands and volunteer to give us the masks that they use for dust control and things like that, these so-called N95 respirators. Um, and there are a couple of... Uh, entrepreneurial uh, companies, some with, even within Massachusetts, that have said, we'd like to go ahead and start making these things in large quantities, and we're just fine with that. We'd be thrilled. When you talk a little bit um, about the, the testing and the availability, availability of testing, I should say, what would the numbers be like if, if everybody who has a, the common cold could be tested in uh, urgent care or, or at their primary care physician? Yeah, I think, you know, if you do it just as a basic math problem, and let's, let's leave aside kids because the attack rate there it appears to be less. I mean, children can be affected, but I think the attack rate is less. But here in the Pioneer Valley, let's say there are 500,000 people. Um, if 20% of them were infected, that would be 100,000 people. Uh, how many would need to come to the hospital? Maybe 10 to 20,000. How many would need intensive care? Maybe two or 3,000. And so those are some pretty big numbers. And uh, the key thing is, uh, the, the, the question is, could you handle that many people? And the answer is it depends. If they all came in a week, we'd be overwhelmed. 
But if they came over a period of two or three months, we could manage it, which is why this whole social distancing thing is being talked about in this idea of flattening the curve. So instead of some big sudden spike, you have this kind of long, slow burn um, at, a, at a pace where the health system can keep up. And when you talk about flattening the curve, how long? I know that there's so, so much anxiety among people, you know, wondering how long we're going to be living in this way. Obviously, it's, it's what must be done. But yeah. what is your expectation? Well, the short answer is no one knows. So this is my best guess. And that's based on what the CDC is telling us now, uh, is that this might peak sometime in early May and that we might be in the midst of it for another three months or so, so maybe into June or July before it finally leaves the area. Probably the good news of the day, if you can believe it, is that in Wuhan, China, they reported no new cases. Uh, and so as a result of their quarantine activities, plus the fact that epidemics like this tend to just burn out, uh, they've gotten no new cases, which means enough people have gotten the infection and have gotten immunity to it that the virus isn't successful in spreading from person to person anymore. But their quarantine me measures are definitely a little bit more stringent. And I think, more I think even now with the uh, measures that have been put in place by the governor, a lot of people are uncomfortable. You know, they're like, what? I, I can't do what I normally have done. Yes. Do you think that's where we would have to move to? I'm not sure. I know that a couple of cities have gone that far. I know it's uh, the greater San Francisco area is a sort of shelter in place. New York has warned that maybe they're going to be going there. Um, I don't know if we're going to need to do that in Western Mass. Uh, it's going to depend on how successful we are in everybody cooperating with the guidelines that have been in place so far. Uh, I think that what we've chosen to do so far puts us in probably the more aggressive group of states. Uh, and that should allow us to get things to sort of slow down. I don't think that there's anything we can do to just stop this, flat out stop it. Uh, but really to get it to slow down would be really a big deal. Surgeon General Jerome Adams had mentioned uh, his concern about the younger generation. And of course, we've seen different news reports uh, just perhaps about maybe not understanding the severity of this, but that the younger generation is still susceptible. How could you explain that for us? Well, I think this virus uh, doesn't pick favorites. It tends to cause more severe disease in older people. Uh, it tends to have a higher attack rate in older people. Uh, but the, uh, you know, the younger generation is not immune to it. And I think, unfortunately, when, when you're in your 20s, you think you're sort of Superman and you can do whatever you want to do. Uh, and I've seen pictures of people on spring break, et cetera, which I really think would be a bad idea. It really does make sense to try to uh, respect this and to take it very seriously and uh, know that there are well-documented cases from people in all age groups. I mean, one of our six, uh, one of our six cases is a school-aged child. And how do you help parents who probably have so much anxiety around this um, kind of, you know, proceed as we're going through just really uncharted territory. I think it's been very stressful. It's going to increase the stress level for everybody and parents in particular talking to children who are going to be anxious. Why am I home from school? Why does everyone seem to feel so anxious? It's important to sort of speak with them uh, calmly and with some assurance that here's what's going on. It's not going to last forever. This is going to go away. Uh, the chances of you as a young child being exposed or low and trying to project a sense of calm and assurance I think is really a critical piece. Can you describe a little bit about when you're talking about that respiratory illness that is actually you know killing people the vulnerable pop population what is happening there? Well a number of things in addition to having the flu type symptoms with high fevers and chills, the virus gets into the lungs and it causes the lungs to leak fluid into the air exchanging spaces. And so people develop a, an inability to uh, get enough oxygen into their body. They get short of breath, they get tired, they oftentimes have to be on a ventilator to breathe for them. And then in advanced situations, uh, they get into something called multiple organ failure where their kidneys and livers shut, shut down and they basically uh, drop their blood pressure. Is and so any, it, it, that's really a serious sign. Is there anything um, that you would like to see done that we're not doing yet? I think that the key thing for everyone to do today is to really observe the guidelines that the governor and that the other authorities have put out around really taking this seriously 
and you know the, the care with hand washing. I know it sounds very simple, but that is the major way viruses like this pass around. That I may have the infection, I touch my face, we shake hands, you touch your face, and then it's game over. Uh, that's the most important thing is to avoid that close personal contact. Wash your hands frequently. Uh, cover your mouth or uh, nose when you cough or sneeze. Um, the issue around disinfecting surfaces, I think uh, it's probably plays some role, although it's the person-to-person -person stuff that's really most important. We really are in a race against time at this point. There will be treatments for this that we'll know about in the months to come. There will be a vaccine for this in a year or two, but we need to act now uh, to prevent this from becoming a catastrophe like what happened in Italy.